Hi everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our fourth unit on cell communication and the cell cycle by discussing topic 4.3, which is on signal transduction. In our last video, which is on 4.2, Introduction to Signal Transduction, uh, we talked about different kinds of receptors, what receptors are, what ligands are, how ligands bind into receptors, um, but we also talked about different ways of that signals are transduced through the actions of phosphorylation cascades um, involving kinases and phosphatases as well as second messengers and we also talked a little bit about what kind of responses um, can be elicited as a result of a signal transduction pathway and how signal transduction pathways they're so varied in each other um, so varied in the amounts of kinases and phosphatases etc um, and second messengers that those uh, signals can be amplified or they can be modified they can be regulated through the process of you know these molecules, these proteins and second messengers. Um, so that's really what we got into today. Today we're going to be continuing talking about signal transduction um, by getting specifically into how what's called the epinephrine pathway works in mammals, which involves a G protein couple receptor or a GPCR. So we're going to get into detail about that, um, but we're going to talk about general examples of different types of signal transduction or how or responses that signal transduction produces. Um, so we're going to talk about signal transduction can affect how a cell responds to environmental stimuli, um, which is involving quorum sensing in bacteria and this epinephrine pathway that we're going to get into more detail about. Um, so when an environmental stimulus uh, causes a signal transduction, these are some examples, um, and signal transduction can also affect gene expression and cell function. All right, so these three talking uh, or that we'll talk about towards the end of the video um, are examples of how gene expression and cell function can be altered by a, a signal that a cell receives. So mating pheromones in yeast, the SRY protein as a result of the expression of the SRY gene in people, and ethylene, which is a small carbon-based molecule, how does that affect the ripening of fruit? Um, so yeah, let's get into it today. Um, so the first example that we're going to talk about, this is an example of when signal transduction elic is elicited as a result of, or excuse me, signal transduction elicits a response as a result of environmental stimulus. Um, so bacterial cells are able to do something called quorum sensing. Um, and here's the thing, bacteria can grow really, really, really fast. Um, they can reproduce about every 20 minutes. All right, so they grow fast and they grow in colonies. So if you've ever smeared an agar plate before, even if you put a ton of bacteria on an agar plate or on a petri dish before with you know lots of food for the bacteria to eat um, you see these little dots right so bacteria grow in colonies um, and why do they grow in colonies that these these little dots why don't they just cover everything well that has to do with quorum sensing bacteria are able to kind of sense in a way um, how densely populated their area is how many other bacterial cells are around them all right, so as bacteria grow, they produce and release some uh, ligands called autoinducers that pass through the biological membranes, the bacterial membranes. All right, um, so as they're, as they're growing and as they're dividing, they're just releasing these, these little red chemicals. Um, so these are called autoinducers. And here's the thing, when autoinducers, they aggregate or they collect inside other bacterial cells, um, they are able to sense the if the internal concentration of autoinducers is higher than the outside concentration of autoinducers. Um, and when the internal concentration is higher than the external concentration of these autoinducers, then it uh, causes a signal transduction pathway in the bacterial cell to stop growing and stop dividing, or at least stop dividing. All right, so bacterial cells, you know, if, they, if there's too many of them in one place, they can. You know, they end up competing for limited resources, and that can be detrimental to the colony. Um, so they are able to kind of estimate the density of their colony by releasing these autoinducers. Um, and these autoinducers can, you know, they bind to DNA, and they can, they can regulate um, the division of those bacterial cells. So it's pretty cool. It can, uh, it can, bacterial cells can limit their own division by releasing these autoinducers. All right, um, so that is an example of how an environmental stimulus elicits a signal transduction and how that signal transduction causes a response. All right, so this is the part that we're going to get into more detail about, as I alluded to a couple times in the last video, and this is the epinephrine signaling pathway. And yeah, I drew a bunch of blobs on your screen again. 
um, but I'm going to explain what each of these blobs are and they're going to be equally important um, when it comes to knowing the specifics of the epinephrine signaling pathway. All right, and this is going to kind of highlight a lot of the stuff that we talked about in the last video. Okay, so if you know what epinephrine is, epinephrine is what's, uh, it's, a, it's a hormone, right? It's what you find in an EpiPen, right? So if somebody's having an, aller having an allergic reaction, uh, you can inject them with an EpiPen and it just contains a bunch of epinephrine. Um, epinephrine is also known as adrenaline, all right? So your body naturally releases epinephrine as a result of some kind of, it's, it's, a, uh, it's what's called the fight or flight response. So some kind of threat or some kind of danger, um, your body's automatically going to be releasing epinephrine. And the thing about epinephrine is, it or adrenaline, it causes an increased heart rate. It causes increased blood flow. It decreases your digestion. It gets your body ready to either fight for its life or run for your life. Okay, so one of those things that epinephrine does, it releases, a, it causes a bunch of different cellular responses. Uh, but we're going to get into one particular response today, um, and that will be breaking down glycogen, which is a polysaccharide that your body stores. Um, into glucose. And glucose, if you remember from last unit, that's our main energy molecule that our mitochondria use to make a bunch of ATP. And when you're in the face of death, right, you're going to need a bunch of ATP to try and stay alive, um, whether that's, again, fighting for your life or running for your life. All right, so this is one pathway that epinephrine is going to elicit here. All right, so this green dot above the cell membrane over here, I kind of assumed you knew this is the cell membrane, um, it is our ligand. And uh, so it's a hormone that travels outside, you know, outside of cells and it attaches to cell surface membrane receptors. In this case, it's called the epinephrine receptor. Um, and yeah, it actually kind of looks like this squiggly line a little bit. Um, GPCRs tend to do that. They are transmembrane proteins. So they, um, they cross the entire membrane like this. All right, so in the ligand bind to a receptor, which is a GPCR. And if you remember what GPCR stands for, it stands for G-protein coupled receptor. So these three dots over here, these are what are called a G-protein. Um, and if you remember from our last video, when a ligand binds to a receptor, the receptor changes shape. And when it changes shape, that's what's going to cause signal transduction. And that's what's going to cause, you know, that's the first domino to fall in a signal transduction pathway. All right, so epinephrine binds to the receptor, it changes shape, and, you know, ATP's jaded cousin, GTP, activates what we call an alpha subunit of the G protein. All right, so this orange, orange guy over here, this is what we call an alpha subunit of that G protein. Proteins can made up, be made up of multiple subunits, and a G protein in this case is made up of three. Alpha, beta, gamma, alpha subunit is the one that we care about. GTP is dropping off some energy, it phosphorylates the alpha subunit, and what does the alpha subunit do? It activates another protein within the cell membrane. It's a transmembrane protein. It's called adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase. Um, and it's an enzyme. All right, so what does adenylyl cyclase do once it's activated? Uh, something else by this alpha subunit? Well, something else that we talked about in the last video are second messengers. Adenylyl cyclase catalyzes the conversion of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, into cyclic AMP, C-A-M-P, CAMP. Um, and cyclic AMP is our second messenger. All right, so we talked about second messengers in our last video as well. Adenylyl cyclase is going to be the enzyme that produces C-A-M-P, or cyclic AMP. All right, so we take some ATP, and we convert it into cyclic AMP. All right, and that cyclic AMP causes a phosphorylation cascade. Remember, we can send out a bunch of cyclic AMP within a cell and amplify a signal. All right, so cyclic AMP is going to um, it's going to activate a protein called protein kinase A. And if you remember from last video too, kinases, protein kinases, are, well, enzymes that are going to activate other proteins. Okay, so they are, um, they receive a phosphate group, they get activated, and they're, what they're going to do is phosphorylate or activate other proteins. And that's exactly what protein kinase A is about to do. So cyclic AMP begins a phosphorylation cascade, activates protein kinase A. All right, there's lots of different protein kinases, but in this case, it's protein kinase A. So what does protein kinase A do? Well, it does what kinases do. It activates another protein. In this case, it's called glycogen phosphorylase. 
hmm, what could glycogen phosphorylase do? All right, well, it's activated through the addition of a phosphate group. So it's activated. We've got our yellow, yellow energy thing around it. Um, but it's going to do something with this glycogen over here. It's an enzyme. What is it going to do with the glycogen? Well, it's going to catalyze the hydrolysis of glycogen into glucose. All right, so this chained molecule that we had on the previous uh, slide here, um, this is representing glycogen. Remember, because glycogen is a long chain of monosaccharides. All right, and glycogen phosphorylase is going to take the energy that it has and it's going to try and hydrolyze, um, which means it's going to do hydrolysis. It's going to break down that mu uh, multiple chain you know, polysaccharide into monosaccharides. And remember, glucose, that's what your body needs for quick energy. All right, that's what your mitochondria need um, in order to start cellular respiration and get a bunch of ATP. And, you know, in the face of death, in the face of certain in danger, um, you're going to need a lot of ATP to, again, either run for your life or fight for your life, fight or flight response. Um, so this is just one of the different ways that epinephrine reduces, or, uh, induces a fight or flight response um, by hydrolyzing glycogen. All right, so back to more examples here. Uh, now we're on to the examples of how signal transduction pathways can elicit changes in cell function or gene expression. Um, so here's an example, yeast pheromones and gene expression. Yeast cells um, can receive signals from other yeast cells that trigger gene expression and division. Um, and in fact, huh, here it comes back again, those particular receptors that receive those pheromones eliciting gene expression are GPCRs, they're G protein coupled receptors. Um, they're activated by GTP and they start a phosphorylation cascade to transcription factors. Um, transcription, this is a topic we're going to get into later in this year, but it's the first step of gene expression. All right, so it's going to, these cells are going to start making proteins um, that are going to allow it to divide and grow. All right, so yeast cells send other signals to other yeast cells to tell them to grow and divide. And so yeast grows. We, we experimented with yeast this year already. Um, another very interesting example of how gene expression can be triggered um, by signal transduction pathways is through the SRY protein. Um, so believe it or not, everybody before the SRY gene is expressed, everybody's a girl, everybody's a female. Um, before, before the the Y the Y chromosome is expressed. So, what does that even mean? Well, I'm well, I'm going to tell you. All right. Uh, so the Y chromosome, if you remember a little bit about you know basic genetics, males or m members of the male sex like myself have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, um, and the members of the female sex have two X chromosomes. All right. So. Uh, females do not have a Y chromosome, so they are not going to have any of the genes on a Y chromosome expressed. Males do. All right, so one of those genes on the Y chromosome is what we call SRY. Expression um, of the SRY gene produces SRY protein, and the SRY protein triggers a pathway to produce two things that make you a male. Um, testosterone in larger amounts. Females produce testosterone too, but testosterone in larger amounts and something called the anti-malarian hormone, which initiates male development. All right, so here's the thing about uh, um, embryos is that they, they express the X chromosome first before the Y chromosome. Um, so everybody, you know, starts off as being a member of the female sex. That's just how it goes. All right. Um, so yeah, this is another good example of how one protein elicits a response um, in various cells called Leydig cells and Sertoli cells um, that make individuals members of the male sex. All right, um, and finally, this is our last example of how a signal can release uh, cause gene expression or um, changes in cellular function. A uh, molecule called ethylene, which is just C2H4, I believe, C2H4. Um, it triggers the expression of enzymes in fruit to increase ripening. It's kind of crazy. Um, so apples actually release ethylene as they ripen. And when other cells in other apples receive ethylene as a ligand, it actually triggers a transduction pathway to increase ripening and uh, fat quicken up maturity of that, uh, of that fruit. Um, so this is what we call a positive feedback loop. This is going to be something that we talk about later in this uh, unit as well, where one, chain, one change in a cell causes more of the same change, right? So a fruit 
So an apple ripens, it releases ethylene, thus it receives more ethylene from, or then it causes, excuse me, let me start over. As apple releases ethylene, causes other fruits to ripen. And when those other fruits ripen, they release ethylene, which causes more ripening, which causes more release of ethylene. That's called a positive feedback loop. It's like a vicious cycle. We're going to talk about that in more detail uh, later in this unit. All right, let me know if you have any questions. That is the end of this video. We'll see you next time.